Give us a picture just shortly uh, of how bad it was when you took over NASDAQ, because it was not pretty. It, it wasn't pretty in that the rules had changed, and we had upstart competitors uh, that were called uh, ECNs, and they were taking our market share every day. And NASDAQ had built a great system. They changed it once a year. It was very reliable. Uh, the upstarts and rickety systems would break, but they would change and improve it every day a week. And so NASDAQ had built the system for a different time and place, and we had to change the culture and, and respond to it. And part of the complication was NASDAQ had been part of the regulator, and my job was to separate from the regulator, and we had a culture associated with being part of the regulator, well, and we had employees who chose to work for a regulator. So talk about that culture, because it's so important. As we always hear, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? Every day. How did you change the culture? Because that's easier said than done. Well, the first thing I did is make dramatic moves in the first day. So I eliminated any conversation of what the culture should be. Uh, I didn't have the time to get into any long debates. It was not uh, something, let's come to a collective decision. I came there with my entrepreneurial background. I said, this is what we're going to become, and there's no, no discussion. So we had a lot of people self-select to leave. Right? And I said, you know, if you don't want to be here, where it's a meritocracy, where we're going to weigh, measure, and count everything, where we'll, results will matter, then leave. Right? You'll be happier somewhere else. It's not a value judgment of what life you choose to live. So we had a lot of that happening. And then we had to move the pieces around. And what was great is you found a lot of great employees uh, in, in that kind of old culture, led by obviously Adina, who's now the CEO, who quickly said this is a better way, and she took to it like a duck to water. Yeah, you know, who'll come back toward the end of the story, actually. Yeah, but, you know. but you also made a lot of acquisitions, quite a few acquisitions, including of one of those ECNs, one of those competitors yeah. on Long Island. Yeah, I had founded one uh, before I'd come to NASDAQ. We acquired that one first, but the most important move we made is to buy INET because we got the best technology on the street. And a lot of the high-frequency firms use some version of INET today. So we gained market share in INET. When I think about the 47 acquisitions we did, the only one that we had to do, independent of the price, was INET because we were at institutional risk. We were losing market share every day, we were losing money every day, and we didn't have in-house any technology on the shelf that had been proven that had great faith in it. So that one we had to do. The rest of the acquisitions were optional, and we were really using that to take strength and build upon further strength. So, so you took NASDAQ and your stock price was going on nicely, and then 2008 happened. Yeah, that was uh, a It difficult put some time. stress on everybody, including you, to be able to, uh, on the systems, basically, to clear all the trades that were coming through. But then there were reforms afterwards, and in your book, you recount a situation where Jamie Dimon, the head of J.P. Morgan, called you up in not altogether a friendly way. Well, there's some four-letter words there, but I, I would say this. One, uh, our systems worked well through the great credit crisis. We were hitting volumes we only saw in the lab, so that was nerve-wracking. We bent, but we didn't break. Then we had the lobbying for what the future sh should be, and it was a professional you know, disagreement in terms of how would, things would play out. One thing I would have to say with, uh, with Jamie, we lived through some difficult times with Facebook, and to his credit, he gave me a call during some of our darkest post-Facebook days and said, Bob, Bob, you know, you'll get through it, it'll work out, and I appreciate that. Well, talk about that Facebook problem, because it was pretty yeah. well known, and it's treated in the book fairly directly. Yes. Where I, I think probably I would say as a non-engineer, your engineers sort of got ahead of you. Yeah, I, 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 this, I, I see it's a really big loop. So I came there, and we had a certain culture. We changed it, and we made the engineers really the king of the ship. And the organization was not balanced. So I did my self-reflection. I said it was my issue because I created a culture where the engineers could overdevelop systems without any check from the people running the businesses. So we had to basically evolve. We learned from it. Uh, we became a more balanced organization and a better organization. Uh, so uh, we just have had this instance where the Hong Kong Exchange tried to buy the right. London Exchange. You took a look at New York Stock Exchange, the London Exchange, things like that at various times. Is that inevitable to have those sorts of consolidations continue right now among the exchanges internationally? Yeah, so it's described in the book. We made two approaches to the London Stock Exchange. Neither of them worked out. Uh, it was there to be uh, consummated, but the price wasn't the right price for us at the time. So what you have to understand with exchanges, we are, and one of the reasons I got hired, they're technology companies, we're transaction processing uh, companies. And what that means is an incremental trade doesn't really cost any money. So NASDAQ has enough processing power, or they did when I was there, to run every equity uh, trade on the planet, on the existing hardware uh, they have. So great scale economics if you do that. So that's going to be always a driver, right? 
Now, what mitigates that driver is the fact that you have regulatory bodies, legislative bodies who may or may not like that deal happening. So Hong Kong, that was a quick round trip in and out. So I don't know all the details of what transpired behind the scenes, but probably it was you know, related to other issues beyond the economics. We're talking with Bob Greifeld, uh, former chairman and CEO of NASDAQ. So, so Bob, uh, right now there's a big dispute, con contest, discussion going on about IPOs, which were terribly important to you at NASDAQ, as opposed to direct listings. But NASDAQ, as I understand it, sort of had both experiences. Didn't you start out with a direct listing before you got there? Uh, we did it when I was there, actually. Oh, when you were there? Yeah, we, we were... Uh, so what's all, the pluses and minuses of direct listing versus IPO? Well, I think the, uh, the direct listing will have a niche. It's not going to go away, but it's not going to take over the market. Right? So if you have zero need for capital, you have a brand in the investment community, then direct listing comes into frame and you have to make your decision. The advantage of the direct listing then is you don't have to get involved with what is the right price, right? So if I'm a company, I come public, the stock is up 40% or down 40%, I'm the CEO of the board. I don't really want to be in that game of trying to decide how, how to play that. I'd rather just get the, uh, the right price. So if you list first and then raise capital a year later, Right, then you'll know the price because the stock is trading. So that's you know an act, uh, attractive alternative to some, but not not to many, I would say. But if you look at tech, which certainly yeah. you specialize in at NASDAQ, we've had several of these IPOs go on, and certainly the investment bankers or the management didn't find the right price. Uh, that's happened. It's right? very disappointing the last few weeks. I, I would say. I, I would also say this though that the public markets will discover the right price uh, with a lot higher frequency than the private market. So when you look at the source of some of this issue, you had, I think, abnormal price discovery happening in the private market. The private market is primarily a bilateral deal between you and I, right? We could get it wrong, right? Public market, you have all to all, a lot of people in it, and the odds of getting the price right are significantly higher. So, so finally, spend one minute on China. China, because there's Please. a lot of talk right now about sort of curtailing investment from the United States into Chinese companies and China in the United States, not just in the White House, but also up in Capitol Hill, because they don't have the same accounting standards. They don't have the same auditing standards. What would that do as a practical matter to capital markets if we curtailed that flow? So first, I would say in the context of the trade discussions, there's a lot of posturing going on. There's a lot of smoke being raised. So I wouldn't pay too much attention until we see what the final deal would happen. I would say the Chinese companies have a great desire to list in the U.S. because we are the deepest, most liquid capital markets by far and away uh, the most efficient. So that's going to be a driving force uh, to make that happen. But with respect to the disclosure and the accounting, our investors, right, under the SEC regulation, expect a high standard. And certainly Chinese companies have to conform to something that's, you know, equivalent, whether that be our standards or IFRS or something like that. You're going to need to see that, right? So I think we have something, you know, that is a good framework that we should continue with.